Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me. I'm Hillary Ramo, your host tonight, right here on Achieve Radio. Thanks for being here. Tonight I have a special guest. I'm hoping and very excited to talk to him. Uh, we're going to be talking about symbols, one of my favorite discussions, um, all kinds of hidden meanings and more and lots of good stuff. Uh, Chad Stumick joins me. He is an author, an esoteric researcher. His investigations range from searching out the secrets of ancient civilizations and their hidden archaeology to probing the present for answers in regards to UFOs, Stargate, symbolism, spirituality, and humanity's greater potentials. So I hope you'll sit back and take a seat and join us, and you can send us your questions, and if you'd like to call in, we are live tonight. If you'd like to talk to myself and Chad, we'd be happy to. Uh, if you have any questions for relating to the show topics or anything else for that matter. There's a lot of go- lot of stuff going on in the world, and I just want you to know that uh, we're open to discussing it, and perhaps Chad can offer some of his insights into the greater symbolism of some of the things happening in the world. We're having some extreme weather come across my area tonight, tornado warnings, all kinds of flash flood stuff, so hopefully we'll be able to ride the wave and we'll make it through the hour. So welcome, Chad. Thank you, Hillary. Really appreciate the opportunity to be on tonight. Well, you know, I've, I've been wanting to talk to you for a while. I, I have been following your stuff on Facebook for some time. I know we tried to schedule a show or two along the way uh, over the last few months. And uh, now, so now we're finally here and we're able to do it. And I think I know why, because one of the things that you posted recently had to do with a very special place that I will be making a pilgrimage to next year with Yes Peru Earth Wisdom, Maria Yes Peru, and the elders that I work with will be traveling there next year as part of a, a pilgrimage and you just happened to start talking about the serpent mound in ohio and i was very excited in fact you even posted a great picture of one of these fabulous coins and i actually copied you and went out and got it <laughs> because uh i was really excited about that so i think timing plays an important role you know we just had the summer solstice you have been uh having some interesting adventures that you've been sharing publicly but before we get into that why don't you share with our listeners, you know, a little bit more about yourself, how you started this, and, and where your journey really began. Well, it actually actually began right around when I turned 30 back in 2005. I had, uh, out of nowhere, a couple of UFO experiences. And up until that point, I, you know, had no interest in any anything like we're talking about today. But after having those couple experiences, it's one of those things that you know, you just gotta know what what you saw, and my mm-hmm. story short, that kind of pushed me into explorer mode, and I started researching UFOs, and I became a UFO investigator for a little while, and that kind of led me into researching the star ancestors and ancient sacred landscapes and the mythologies and legends that surrounded them, and that led me to a friend and investigative mythologist, William Henry. Mm-hmm. We talked a lot about this stuff, but also incorporated the nearby cities and the parks in the cities. Well, I started really becoming interested in that because I was living in Detroit, and I happened to have one of these parks right a mile from my house. And it just blew me away once I started to decode the symbolism in this park. And that in itself just put me on the road. I, you know, From that point on, I've been going to city to city and different sacred landscapes and just trying to look at some of the ancient symbolism as well as the modern symbolism that's starting to emerge. Well, I find it interesting that UFOs started you on that path. I've spoken to many other people who seem to have that same similar experience, at least, where, you know, they have some kind of unidentified flying object experience, whatever it may be, and it just opens up their awareness, their consciousness, and they begin to see the world a little differently, or a lot differently, actually, and they move into a different space where they're able to actually, what I like to call it is kind of hitchhiking the cosmic flow, you know, you kind of hook up to it, and there you are, and you're going like like a river, and, and you know, you can either just ride it and, and watch where it takes you, or you can fight it and find a place to hang on. It's, it's really a fascinating thing and and speaking of william henry he will be on the show july 11th he'll be here live oh, for those of you yeah so um you might want to come back because after our show tonight we may talk about something and synchronistically something might pop up and getting ready for him to come on so it's wonderful <laughs> that you do have such a good connection um so Ch- 
Chad, you know, so now that you have found yourself kind of wandering and, and, and intentionally walking through this grand path of symbolism and sites and seeing the modern places that you're, you know, you're going to and finding all these connections, um, do you feel that, you know, there's kind of this one foot in the modern world, one foot in the ancient world, where if you go and you, you know, you make a pilgrimage to the great, you know, the pyramids in Giza, or you go to Machu Picchu in Peru, uh, or you go to the city park where they have these wonderful things. Are, are we looking at kind of a continuation of this sacred symbolism, do you think? Or is it that the modern day, uh, you know, grand architect designers put these things into effect for other purposes? Or what are we looking at? Are we looking at a modern day kind of setup that holds energy and power for these places, or is it just a coincidence that they happen to have these? Well, see, as many as I've looked at now, it's, it's definitely way beyond coincidence. And I like the way you put it, a continuation of the ancient symbolism, because that, that's kind of how I'm starting to see it. Now, kind of what my research is now revolving around is, like I said, I go to these ancient sacred landscapes, say, for instance, the Serpent Mound, and I'll look at all the symbolism that whoever built it, the ancient culture built that they incorporated in these mounds. And lot, lots of times right nearby these mounds, in some cities right on top of where the mounds used to be, where the urban centers have been built, and some of these modern parks, there's certain parks that are showing up that contain the exact same symbolism as the ancient mound sites. I mean, I mean, right down to aligning to the same stars. Uh, for instance, the Serpent Mound in Cincinnati, the nearby city, there's literally a park. It's a serpent park, and it's identical to the Serpent Mound, and all through the parts has corresponding symbolism. And this is happening city to city in Detroit, where there was ancient mounds. Now the parks emerged, and all the monuments have been aligned to Orion, as well as the Giza Pyramids. And this just keeps happening. And what I'm starting to feel is whoever built these ancient mounds, I feel like they were probably tapping into some sort of cosmic energy, or cosmic information, and probably coming up with the blueprints for these. And I feel like when these modern artists and architects are coming down to the same general locations, I feel like if they're tuned into this, they may be receiving these same cosmic downloads. And many times I think it's literally unconscious. They'll have contests. These artists go down there, and they're supposed to get a feel for what fits in with the part, get a sense for what works. And nine times out of ten, the guy who comes up with, you know, these cosmic designs, it fits, and it works, and he's getting a commission. So I just feel like there's some type of, I'm not sure if it's the spirit of the landscape itself, if this information is possibly coming from the cosmos or another possibility is most of these are built in the vicinity of ancient burial grounds so another possibility is the spirits of the deceased of the ancients so it's still a little bit up in the air exactly who is you know giving these cosmic downloads but i feel they're coming from somewhere and i don't feel like some people ask you know is, is it masons or is it a secret society and I, I would have to say definitely not. I really don't think it is. It's, it's so far beyond that. There's just too many synchronous, synchronicities that line up where this is some cosmic information that's coming from a cosmic source. And it, it's just a really incredible scenario, and it's taking place all across the world right now. Well, that's an interesting uh, suggestion and I like that because I think what happens is so many people get caught up in the negative symbolism they often overlook what the the higher the higher message the bigger message you know the cosmic message so to speak and considering the fact that this journey began for you with UFO contact with with the at least the acknowledgement of something outside of your understanding um, without knowing the specifics of your experience, of course. But, you know, it, it does open up a, a level of consciousness, just like if you were to perhaps do, you know, ayahuasca or some kind of power plant where it opens up your consciousness. Or even people who have profound meditation experiences, uh, you know, I think it, whatever whatever it is for anybody, you know, it opens us up to a level of understanding. And there is certainly something there. And, and it's nice to know that you're still exploring it and you're 
you're still open to the theory of what it may be and you haven't That's closed yourself point. off to the fact that it is this or that like so many people have. Um, do you feel that, you know, and this, this is just an observation that I make as well, is that, you know, this, this knowledge, whatever they're doing and however they're building these things, this knowledge is very old. It's very ancient. Um, yeah, sure, some of the secret societies understand it and know it, but it's not just being put together for evil purposes to take over the world, like pinky in the brain, you know? <laughs> we're, off to take, we're off to take over the world. But, you know, it, the harnessing of energy, the harnessing of consciousness, the harnessing of cosmic energy, putting forth into an idea or a platform or a culture or uh, an, an ideal or whatever it is, you know, I mean, isn't that pretty much what these kinds of places do? They hold, they gather energy, they hold energy. And when you go on them, for example, if you're sitting on the Serpent Mound and you're meditating, well, I think you probably are going to get a little bigger boost than if you're sitting down, you know, somewhere else, <laughs> potentially, you know, because it's designed that way. So what are your thoughts on the fact that, you know, this, this really is a, a, something that has really been understood in higher levels of society and perhaps secretly given down in the sense of symbolism through people being able to just walk through a park and look at it and, and unconsciously understand it, yes? Absolutely, and I think that's exactly what they are, is energy accumulators, in particular, cosmic energy accumulators. And I think that's why both the ancient mound sites as well as the modern Stargate parks and urban portals we're talking about, I think that's why they're all aligned to the stars and to the heavens, is to draw down these cosmic energies. And, you know, when you go to these places, you can feel it. it like you said, it's, it's different than if you sit at home and meditate in your yard, if you meditate at the serpent mound it's not the same you can literally feel it it's palpable you know and I think that's the main point of the modern sites I like to call them cosmic temples because when you go down there you literally can connect with the heavens and I think that's what all of this is about connecting with heaven connecting with the heavens connecting with the stars and you know Gaining that a cosmic consciousness, a cosmic awareness, being able to step outside the box and take the bird's eye view and, you know, look at the world from a new perspective, really. I think that's the, really, the gist of it is be able to gain that new cosmic perception of the world. And when you go to these parks as well as the ancient mound sites, that's what you, that's what I get out of them. And I believe that's what a lot of people get out of them. Mm. Now, what are you working on now as far as, you know, your, your uncoverings, your, you know, in your exploration? What are you finding? Uh, well, my, I just finished an article, actually, on the circuit mom we're talking about. And about a month ago, I went down there, you know, and did some explorations of the mound itself. And one of the main things I was looking for at the serpent mound is there supposedly in, in the egg, well, the serpent mound, if people aren't familiar with it, the head of the serpent opens up into what looks like a cosmic egg. And there was supposedly an ancient monolith that used to be in the center of this cosmic egg as a lightning attractor. So I went there because legend has it that this monolith was thrown over the edge of the cliff by the head of the serpent. And you go down there and you take the, the river walk path below and I actually found the monolith down there. So I started doing a little research about this and People believe that this monolith may have been a lightning attractor, an energy accumulator, like we're talking about. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I'm doing this research, a brand new science article came out, Scientific American, talking about lightning, and the uh, Russian scientists starting to believe that cosmic waves, cosmic rays, I'm sorry, may actually be catalysts for lightning. So I'm thinking, you know, if that's the case, not only was the serpent and this monolith able to collect the electromagnetic lightning energy, but also the cosmic energies. So that was that was the first part of my exploration, as I wanted to go there and, you know, make sure this monolith was there and do a little research on it. And it's a pretty amazing scenario. Now, the second half of my exploration really was, like I said, I go to these ancient sites and I want to go to the city nearby to see if there's a corresponding park. And sure enough, in Cincinnati, there's a brand new park and 
called the friendship part. And this part was laid out just like the serpent mouth. I mean, from the tail to the head, uh, when my article comes out, feel free to look at the images, but it's identical. Now, I talk about a lot of the symbolism being unconscious, and I believe that's the same case with this part. Uh, they describe it as a friendship bracelet, you know, rather than a serpent. They describe it as a friendship bracelet because it's a friendship part on one aspect, and they also say that the winding path can also be symbolic of DNA. So it's a really cool part, but when you put the comparisons of the serpent mound over top of it, it's identical, right down to the head and the cosmic egg. Now, where the head is in the part, in the cosmic egg, there's a giant crystalline tower. And when you put those over top of each other, it would have occupied the exact same spot as the monolith back at the ancient mound. And it's identical symbolism, you know, a thousand years apart, and surely the lady who put that crystalline tower at the park had no idea about the monolith at the serpent mound. I'm pretty sure of it. But you can go all the way through the park, and there's the same kind of symbolism keeps showing up. There's, you know, around the serpent mound, there's legends of giants and giant bones being discovered in the mounds. Well, when you go to the serpentine park, there's a giant earthen mound. It's called the Giant Hands, and it's two giant hands that have two stone spirals that spiral into the palm of the hands and the signs there's something along the lines of sit in the palms of the giant's hands and reconnect with the past <laughs> and then you go down just a little further down the path and there's another monument it's called the air castle it's, it's uh, the outside of it is done in like this mirrored like imaging if anyone's ever seen cloud gate where it literally looks like it dissolves into the sky. That's why it's called the Air Castle. And it's symbolic, they say, of a celestial city descending from the sky. So, and, so this is the kind of symbolism that's showing up in these parts. It's just incredible. You have a great picture of it on your Facebook page. I'm looking at it right now, actually. Who does these graphics for you? They're fabulous. I do all those myself, actually. Thank well, you. you do a great job. Um, do you have a place where people can go and look at this? But besides, if they don't, if they're not friends with you on Facebook, do you have a website or, you know, some place uh, yeah. where people can? Uh, this article we're talking about right now, the Serpent Mound article, won't be posted for probably another week. I just got it to my webmaster today, literally. So this article will be posted in about a week. But for uh, any of my other articles, uh, my website is www.chadstemke.com. And I have several articles there, uh, one on Stargate Detroit, one on Stargate St. Louis. I got uh, one of my video lectures on there, and a couple other random radio interviews, you know, quite a bit of <laughs> stuff for people to check out. Some good stuff, yeah, it definitely is worth it. So if you're listening right now, go to his website, check him out. If you're on Facebook, uh, add him as a friend. You can follow along with his great work, what he's doing. Now, you talk yeah. about something called modern-day myth-making. What is that? Well, when I'm talking about these cities, when I, well, whenever we're talking about ancient mythology, we're usually talking about, you know, all these ancient cities, these ancient sacred sites, the gods and the gods, goddesses that surround them. And I feel like all these new parts, I feel like this is the same scenario. This is the building of a modern-day myth. We're building all these stargate parks and these cosmic temples. And I literally feel like someday, you know, people are going to look back on this as, this was a myth, the emergence of cosmic temples throughout all the cities in the world. And I feel like that's what's happening. And usually, you know, I'd assume most times people don't realize when they're living in the middle of a myth taking place. And I feel like that's what's happening right now. And how cool is it to be able to realize it's happening and become part of it, visit these places, even help to discover them. Why do you think that when it comes to this particular topic of decoding, that it's a lot of men usually doing this work? No offense. <laughs> but why does, I think, um, I think I could name maybe two women on one hand here, you know, who actually pick this up and, and, uh, go along and, and do the same thing. But why do you think it's, it, it is that it's a mostly a male type 
thing because that's what it feels like to most people that it's men who go in and decode these places and find the symbolism and do all of this stuff i don't think women have been given a fair shot into going into it that's my own personal opinion but what are your thoughts on that wow that's a, that's a revelation i honestly never thought of that but you're absolutely right a hundred percent i can only think of a few myself and I tell you what, we we could really use the help, ladies, if there's anyone out there. <laughs> because, because, I mean, because this is all about perception and how we perceive things. And we all know guys and girls don't always perceive things the same way. So if we could team up and, you know, I, two sets of eyes are always better than one. I never thought about that, Hillary, but that is a great, great point. Um, I don't have a reason for it, but I uh, do ask the ladies for help because we could... <laughs> I think it has to do with the two halves of the brain, personally. But I think if you merge those, you end up with something pretty, pretty spectacular. Um, I think women, if they get into this kind of research, would be very successful working with men Absolutely. because Absolutely. the way that just because women are more psychically in tune, intuitively in tune. Not that guys are, but uh, let's face it, ladies have a little certain <laughs> finesse when it comes to that stuff. And uh, I think uh, absolutely. And, and as a matter of fact, I think um, Susan Seymour Height, I don't know how, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her last name correctly. It's H-E-D-K-E. She has done a lot of great work. I, I follow her on Facebook as well. Um, maybe I'll ask her to come on the show and ask her that same question, see what she thinks. Yeah, um, You know, it, it's, it's, um, it's something I believe very strongly that's developing in the mind of human beings, that we're starting to choose to, to, to really clue into these particular <clears throat> nuances of symbolism where we can then decode it in a way that gives us a higher message, that really pulls us into the heart and takes us out of the mind. And I think that's where women women come in. They, they can help that male perspective come more into the heart. And it's Absolutely. in the heart that we begin to really translate these things and move into bigger, bigger, bigger places. So we need each other to do it. I think it's something we should be working together on. Um, I agree. <clears throat> so, Chad, what do you feel is, you know, uh, do, you, do you think people are going to get it? Do you, I mean, do you think that have we become so disconnected from our past, you know, wandering these ancient, wonderful places left to us by our ancestors? And have we have we gotten so disconnected, do you think, that this is some way to perhaps jar our memory or to continue the the uh, the movement through that? Um, what, what do you think about humanity on a whole when it comes to these places? I do think they're going to get it. I really do. I mean, just over the few years I've been doing this, I've watched it, you know, in popularity grow immensely. Everything from, I mean, everything from TV shows to movies to commercials. I mean, the idea of the portal and the Stargate and the just cosmic consciousness in general is, is becoming a lot more accepted, 100%. When, when I take people to these parks, they take their friends, their friends usually take their friends, and I mean, I've watched it really spread like wildfire through the couple of places I, I'm looking at. And I think people are going to get it. The bigger question is, is how are the people going to perceive it? I perceive these as cosmic temples, wonderful places. But then there's some people, like you mentioned, who think these are evil for some reason. But when you go down to these places, that is not the feeling you get. You, you get just the absolutely incredible feeling of cosmic consciousness connecting with the cosmos and I think when people actually go down there firsthand rather than just looking at images and speculating it's, it's an incredible experience that they want to share with others I mean I mean we can even as far as popularity even even Google has recently came out with a game pretty much just just like what we're talking about the augmented reality game called ingress where they send people out into the cities looking for portals. And it's the biggest game out there right now. So I think it's definitely going to catch on, but where the where researchers come in is I, I want it to catch on in the right way. You know, I don't want them to be perceived wrongly without people actually taking the time to go down there themselves. Yeah, I think first-hand experience is really important. I know when I first exactly. went to visit the 9-11 memorial when it was first up, 
uh, the experience was not what I expected. And uh, I really didn't have, well, actually, I should take that back. I didn't really have any expectations when I went down, but I was surprised at how I did feel in certain ways because I was able to be on that site when it first, when 9-11 first happened. So I felt the, the shift and the two different perspectives and the two different ways of how that particular site was vibrating at those two very powerful, potent times. So... These places do ship. Now, I just want to, I want to comment quickly and uh, get on my soapbox here for a second because people have to understand that if you want to change the world and you want to move on, you have to move on. I mean, you really have to move on. You can't just say, oh, we want to be all one and we want to have this great, wonderful experience and we all want to, you know, move into a different, better world. And uh, but but, you know, we're not going to forgive and we're not going to forget the past. And, you know, when you go to these kinds of places and you see the symbolism and you have perhaps read a book or listened to somebody who claims to know what the symbolism is and what it means. And it's all this and it's all that and it's all negative and black and dark. um, You're really doing your yourself a disservice by by not allowing yourself to stay open to these things and to go into these places because no matter what the intention you still have your own intention and you still are powerful enough to be able to override whatever negative affection is there and so it's it's something that people really need to discern themselves they need to seek it out they need to let things go and not necessarily just take what other people say as a uh, gospel and not make up their own minds because isn't that what we're used to um you know we're moving into this new phase the indigenous that i work with call we've already moved into the fifth world we're already here some of the great cycles of religions and spirituality uh, have come and gone we've we've crossed over to the other side so now we have to really let go of what's been in the past and we have to take a look at what's happened and how we're we're approaching things in our own personal lives and also collectively and so if we can walk into a place like Friendship Park and make the leap between the old world and the new world and then really sit with it and ponder what that means for us and the possibilities and and infinite potential that that um, allows us, then we're doing the world a better thing. We're doing ourselves a better thing. Our family is a better thing. Our our partners, everybody involved. Um, This is not to say that you can't turn the news on and have an opinion about uh, people like Edward Snowden (laughs) or what's going on with the NSA leaks or you can't stay up to date on what's happening in the world it doesn't mean you have to throw your tv out it doesn't mean you have to fear every thunderstorm that comes blowing over the top of your house or every you know uh, gritty thought you have or anything like that this is really about acceptance moving into a cosmic perspective and holding our own when it comes to these and uh, being able to share that and and really just know who we are and know our center and not let other people push us off it with displaced anger or you know uh, other problems that they have so um that's the message that i've gotten out of a lot of these places i've encouraged people myself to go out and look at these places experience them look at the symbolism because it really is a fascinating topic when you start to, to pick this apart and look at these places and look at the symbolism and then match the energies to the ancient cultures um you're really rewriting history don't you think Oh, a hundred percent. And very importantly, like you said, is don't listen to everything you hear. You know, every even me. Don't listen to every researcher. But what you want to do is, when you're looking at these places, the first thing you do is just read the signs on the wall. The second thing is, if you're really interested, find out what the artist or the architect has to say about it. And I mean, for instance, you just talked about the 9/11 memorial. And some, of course, some people, right off the bat, Illuminati, it's evil, you know. But what what the architect had to say, he said, this is New York's iconic new gateway. And I just look forward to a time when that space will open up to the heavens and I can see the angels come down. Now, to me, that's not evil, you know. I just like to tell people, you don't have to do a lot of research if you're not into it, but just read the signs at the monuments. And if you're interested, see what the artists and architects have to say. And you'll, for the most part, get the story right there. 
I was at um, the 9-11 Memorial a couple of years ago with Robert Bouval. We had dinner when he was visiting his New York publishers, and we went down to the 9-11 Memorial, and he said something very interesting to me, and I think I've shared this story with my listeners before, but I'm going to say it again because it's relevant here. He said that places like this, and he was referring to the 9-11 Memorial, uh, create a kind of frequency, residence kind of feel, uh, an initiation of sort. He says to me, he goes, how do you initiate an entire city when everybody believes something different? Well, right. you build a giant tower in the middle of it with all of the appropriate symbolism, and you let it go to work on people's um, unconscious minds, super conscious minds. All of that deeper, hidden part of people that look up at something, and, and we know that symbols register deeply into the mind. It, it goes as far as it can go, pretty much. So when you have a place like this, and you know, you, you're walking around, and you're going to get your coffee, and you're going to work, and you're buying groceries, and you're catching a cab, and you're going to a museum and you're doing all this stuff well you're right in the middle of it and he was right and it took i was kind of like okay let me think about this for a little while you know after he said it but then it made a lot of sense to me and since then i have noticed that as these places are placed all over the world in all kinds of major cities um it's it's just really interesting to see the effects of it if you are i guess observing it from a, a level of consciousness people's ability to step out of the box and move into a different place um so so you when you're going through this work and you know you're you're out here and you're you're kind of in the field and you're going into these places uh for you personally what has it done for you Oh, it's, it's literally changed my life, literally changed my life. Just the way I perceive the world around me, uh, my friends, the people around me, everything has really changed by visiting and by visiting these parks. It's just once you realize that something is what you believed previously to be as insignificant as a park can actually mean the world to you, you start to realize everything's like that you start to realize that things that weren't as important are more important you start to perceive reality in general different and uh to me in a much better light i mean i'm a i'm a changed person from the time i started this to now and i, I would like to hope to say it in a better way and I've, I've watched other people it just changes the way they perceive the world around them and i, I think that's a huge huge personal transformation to be able to, you know, for a park to be able to have on people. And like, well, like that would be the point, too, right? That would be the point. Exactly. I mean, maybe maybe centuries ago we had ritual and ceremony done at these sites, and uh, you know it, it, that was part of the the culture and how they connected to the cosmos. Today we might t- pack a picnic and go sit in Friendship Park and catch a few rays, <laughs> exactly. and we may not be doing ritual or ceremony necessarily, but at least we're still physically experiencing it, right? Exactly. And what I always like to point out is, like I mentioned earlier, almost always these modern Stargate parks are located either on top of or right next to the ancient sacred landscapes. Uh, so go to St. Louis, for instance. You have Cahokia Mounds, and then five miles away you have the Gateway Arch and Jefferson National Expansion. So what I always tell people is you can't have a better day than going to Get up in the morning, go to the ancient sacred landscape, climb the pyramids, you know, connect with the past, connect with the ancient cultures, and then partway through the day, go to the modern Stargate Park, go to the Gateway Arch, connect with the Rainbow Bridge symbolism. And in the basement of the Gateway Arch, Thomas Jefferson has a sculpture standing in a space-time continuum. So I tell him to go to the ancient sites, go to the modern sites, be in the past, be in the moment, and sometimes you're going to catch glimpses of the future. It's like a, it's like a true gateway experience you can have in a single day if you want. 
I was recently down in Florida back in February of this year, and I was visiting the Crystal River Mounds, and we were doing uh, a variety of different things down there, and it was quite fascinating. We actually had the whole park to ourselves, and we were able wow. to spend a lot of time on those mounds, a lot of time, and we were able to, to actually down, do a lot of very special work down there. And once you start realizing, when you connect to these places, you would be astonished at how many there really are. I mean, I could not believe how many mounds there really are all the way through the Gulf Coast of uh, Florida, all the way down quite far, even past in the in the Sarasota area, if you go down that far. And then, you know, when you start to really look at what's here in the United States, you have a whole bunch of mounds, very, very large mound area down towards Louisiana. Have you ever been down there? I haven't been down there, but, yeah, there's some monsters down there, absolutely. Yeah, there, I mean, there are so many of them, and the majority of the public has all but forgotten about these ancient sacred landscapes there. Looks like we just lost. We might have lost Chad. We're going to get him back on the line for you guys having some technical difficulties tonight. But what I found interesting and what I'd like to keep talking about while well, we try to get him back on here is uh, the fact that these these sites are so I'm thoroughly... Back. You're back. Yay! Well, I'm I wanted back. to... <laughs> We know what happens, you know. It's live radio. What can you expect? So anyway, you I didn't know what even I was, know I was gone. <laughs> Did you keep talking the whole time? Yep. yep. <laughs> yeah. So we missed all that. So we we got to start back. We were talking about Louisiana, the mounds, and how these sites are really pertinent throughout the United States that we really aren't aware of. And then we lost you, and uh, that's where I don't know. I, I don't. I'm assuming the listeners lost you at the same point. That's where I lost you anyway. Um, my question, really going into that specifically is i mean why do we not know what's in our own backyard well that's the big question and we should i think a lot of it goes back back to archaeology in the late 1800s and early 1900s and you know just they didn't make it as important of a thing as it should have been to us and some of the bones went to the smithsonian and that was the end of them and other times farmers just Literally, when they were moving throughout the country, they just dug up the mounds, seeing if anything was in them, but they just plowed them down to make room for the field. To them, it really, other than looking for treasure, which there was very little treasure in any of these mounds, they weren't important to the people in the 1800s. So we lost a lot, you know, a lot of information we wish we would have now and a majority of the mounds. Uh, that said, we, there's still a lot of them. And like you said, most people don't recognize them. And that's one of the things I really want to help to change because they are sacred landscapes. You know, they're special places. And the ones that are remaining feel like they deserve some attention, definitely. The whole Ohio area is very interesting. Now, um, from what I understand, there used to be a rather large complex in that particular part of the United States that had to do with Native Americans settling. And this was really quite a big complex, and it went through Ohio and I believe into another state as well, if I'm recalling it correctly. But have you found that, that you have also made your way to those particular areas? Um, the, the name escapes me at the moment, but it's one of those large... Uh, almost like a temple-like layout complex of sites. Uh, Newark Earthworks, possibly. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yep, thank you. Yep, actually, I on the same trip I went to the Serpent Mound, I visited the Newark Earthworks also. And like you said, they are enormous. Literally, well, there's a octagon and a circle, and that's now turned into a, actually, that's turned into a golf course. And then... I believe it's seven miles away, the octagon and circle was connected via a seven-mile-long mound pathway to another circle, which was called the Great Circle. And this is the largest earthen circle in the world, just enormous. You can hardly, I mean, it's so big you can hardly see the other side of the circle. And in the middle of the earthen circle, there was a Birdman mound. And supposedly where this Birdman mound was is where the shaman, would do their ceremonies uh, connecting with the heavens, the bird man was the messenger. So, and, I mean, this, this mountain site was so big, the modern-day city, I mean, they got a whole city built within where this mound site was. So uh, the, the sacred geometry and the stuff these ancient cultures were able to use is really, really mind-bending. 
uh, build a build these sacred architecture structures seven eight miles apart, all with perfect alignment. Not having modern day tools is to me is still somewhat of a mystery. I, I had when you go to these places, you have trouble comprehending how they could actually do these measurements and whatnot. But they did it, mm-hmm. and it's an absolutely amazing part of the Ohio Valley. And anyone that goes to visit the Serpent Mound, I would highly recommend make the trip. It's about two hours north to the Newark Earthworks. And it's just like all these other sites, it's cosmically aligned to all kinds of different lunar and solstices. It's all about aligning these sites to the heavens. Every single site I went to on this last trip, these sacred sites are all aligned to the stars. Well, if we were to actually make the effort to do all of this, we would certainly have to rewrite a few textbooks in this country. (laughs) We would certainly have to replan how history is taught in the uh, lower grades. That's for sure. That would mean quite a bit of work for some people. (laughs) Chad, um, when when we were talking about this, you know, coming together on the air and doing a show, you had said you wanted to talk about, you know, some things you had kind of put it out there. And one of the things you talked, you, you mentioned was giants. And that kind of caught my eye. And I'm like, oh, I got to ask him about that. Now, now, what did, what did you mean by talking about giants? Well, when, when I'm doing all this research in Ohio Valley, and I'm looking at what, what are called the antiqui, antiqui, sorry, it's hard to pronounce, antiquitarian magazines, which were in the late 1800s. Each town had their own little magazine each year, just talking about the discoveries and the weather and the farms, just a little bit of everything. And in a lot of these magazines from the 1800s, when they were digging up these mounds, they have reports of bones of giants being discovered, bones of people from anywhere from seven to, in some cases, 12 foot tall being discovered in the mounds all throughout the Midwest. I mean, some places as far out as Utah and California, but the majority are all throughout the Ohio Valley in the Midwest. So it's, you know, it's hard to comprehend. And the, the problem is, is that there are no bones left. There are no, there's no place you can go to see these giant bones that were discovered. And in pretty much every instance in these magazines, when they make the discovery of these giant bones, they'd be sent to the Smithsonian Institute, and, well, they would disappear. None of these giant bones were ever to be seen again. But hundreds and hundreds of magazines and newspapers, I mean, the New York newspapers, Boston, Detroit, they all reported on these bones of giants being discovered like it was common stance at the time. It, it wasn't even unusual. And now, besides just researchers, but the public, this has all been but forgotten. And these, when you look at the legends of the Native Americans and the same general vicinity, every, pretty much every tribe had the legends of the giants. So I'm just, I'm really starting to dig into them, but there seems to be some connection with this whole Ohio Valley, the mounds, the legends of the giants. And the other aspect of my research that comes into it is the Michigan copper mystery. So whenever these giants are found, more times than not, they were wearing copper armor, copper implements, sometimes had little copper treasures with them, but they always seem to be connected with the copper. And we have a mystery in Michigan. We're missing supposedly a half million pounds of copper from the Upper Peninsula. So it's one of my side projects right now is trying to figure out the connection between the giants and the copper mystery because it seems like there's def- a definite connection even up there where they they actually all the ancient copper mining was done and this was carbon dated 5,000 years ago on the cliff rocks by the copper mines is actually this giant handprint petroglyphs made with giant hands and they also found what are called hammer stones all around there which were the giant axe heads that were made out of stone. But some of these hammer stones weighed 30 and 40 pounds. There's, you know, there's no way even a, you know, a big guy could be swinging a 40 pound hammer all day long. It's just, you know, it's pretty uncomprehendable. So there's, there's all kinds of these little clues connecting the giants, the copper, and then most of them were discovered in the Ohio Valley. So I'm still piecing it together a little bit, but Every legend, you know, has legends of these giants in the Ohio Valley. Interesting. So, That's and, very and interesting. 
one other aspect of it is, and I'm still working on this, this sounds a little strange, but when you go back to the ancient text, say the Bible, Book of Enoch, Book of Giants, they talk about the Nephilim and how they were to be punished on the earth. They, when they died, their souls couldn't go to heaven. They had to reincarnate here on earth. And they say they would try to reincarnate, you know, into humans or just reincarnate the information, what, what have you. Well, what's weird is where a lot of these modern parks are popping up, these Stargate parks by the ancient mounds, many times the ancient mounds that these giant bones were found in. Well, I keep talking about it and I've been talking about it for years. You know, this information, is, this cosmic information is coming from somewhere. Not sure where, not sure if it's the cosmos, the, the landscape itself, but there's this cosmic information coming from somewhere. So, the, you know, the more I look into this, the more I find that by these starry parts, there seem to have been remains of giants. And I've also speculated coming, you know, from the deceased or whatnot. So now I'm kind of, kind of working on could it possibly be the spirits of the deceased giants that are feeding this information through the artists and architects? And, you know, this is obviously pure speculation on my part. But, you know, the clue, the clues are there. You know, the clues are there. So that's something I'm kind of trying to follow up on. Well, that's very interesting. And, and so when will you be updating us on your, your findings with this? Will you be posting it on your website? Or are you open to people contacting you to, to help give you more information if somebody has it? And how would they, they do that? Uh, yep, I am always, always open for more information, open for help, and just communication in general. Uh, they, my email address is info at chadstemkeep.com. Please email me any info or if you just want to talk about something in general. And, uh, yeah, say I got the Serpent Mount article. I just got that to my webmaster. That should be out in about a week or so. And the 6,000 word article, uh, 30 pages. So it's, it's like a half a book that I just put the new article on there. <laughs> give away for free, so I hope everybody enjoys it if you can make well, it. Well, you know, okay, I have something to say about that. Okay, first of all, you should put it in a book and you should do what the rest of them do and you should charge for it because that's what everybody does, basically, at this point. Because you're, you're, what you're doing is valuable. Have you found that you find it, it, what, I, what I found interesting when you were talking about the giants and how you feel like the spirit of them is coming through, that there's some kind of communication there. Have you, have you had channeling experience yourself since you've been spending so much time on these sites doing this work looking into it synchronistically following these kind of you know dots through the cosmic uh, trail so to speak have you found that you find yourself connecting to that and, and coming through and I'm going to say it have you channeled things I would say, I, I don't know if I'd use the word channel but I, I would say that 90% of my information like initially the it comes from the first or second time I go to these parts. Initially, I read the signs, and then it's like the best way I can describe it is you get unusual thoughts. Like you think of, you think of things you wouldn't have thought of. That's the best way I can put it. I, you get unusual thoughts that you know you get information. I guess maybe you could call it channeling. Uh, but yeah, you just I read the signs, and then just weird weird thoughts come to you. Tons of synchronicity. Like the main thing that happens is synchronicity after synchronicity, and you know once the fifth or sixth synchronicity happens in an hour, or so you start to realize it's probably more than a synchronicity. It's most likely a message of some sort, <laughs> and that's, that's kind of just what happens. You just go down there, open hearted, go down there, enjoy yourself, and when the synchronicities start falling into place to the point your mouth is just kind of hanging open, you know. You know you're onto something, or something's there, kind of guiding you, so to speak. And that's that's kind of what how I, I guess you could call it channeling in a way. I've never really called it that, but I definitely feel there's something guiding your way when you go there, open-minded and aware, and you know you're looking for that. But at the same time, like say Stargate Detroit, for instance, it's in the heart of downtown Detroit, heart of Plaza, and a million people a year walk through this park. I mean, literally, they walk, there's a Stargate monument. No, people walk under the Stargate monument, over the pyramid, underneath the Horus and Sun fountain, and, you know, out of that million people, probably a thousand of them recognize the symbolism. 
you know. So what I'd like to do is if a million people go to these places, if we can just get a, a percentage of those people to start being aware of where they're at and the symbolism there and the you know, just imagine the effect if we could get a percentage of that million people to connect with each other with the park and start perceiving everybody there in a new light in a better light. It you know, and if we can do that in each city, that's we could have a monumental effect I think. Well, you are channeling, and that's what I call it. <laughs> Getting okay. back to that, um, okay. I know, and, and that's a that's a woman's input. I think that's where this. Uh, I think, but we go back to that original comment back there that, you know, uh, the the woman insight into this. You definitely are channeling. I mean, when we go to these sites, when I work with um, the Shimas, I mean, that's what they do. They'll sit on top of the mound and they'll channel whatever comes through, and somebody better be paying mm-hmm. attention or writing it down, or recording oh. it because what comes through is exactly what you describe. And uh, if you don't already, Chad, you need to bring a tape recorder, a, a piece of paper, and a pen, and you need to write down what's coming through when you go to these places because you are right. connecting directly to source. And whatever is illuminating or has illuminated or continues to illuminate these places absolutely is calling to you and working through you in this way. And it's part of it's part of what your destiny is and what you're supposed to be doing. And, it, and it, so it is for everybody who starts to tap into this. It really is part of uh, some kind of evolution and consciousness that we're all a part of and happens for everybody and nobody is special in that sense and everybody is equal and it's so it's it's really a wonderful thing that you're doing for yourself um now i know you're married now now how does your your wife feel about all this does she join you on these excursions uh yeah she goes on me with it goes with me on some of them uh that said i got a couple of dogs and a cat, so somebody has to watch the watch the animals when I'm gone for too long. But yeah, she's very, very. I couldn't ask for a more supportive wife. I'm very lucky, you know. You know how it is, research, and you're half half there and half not there sometimes. So <laughs> she's very supportive, and I couldn't appreciate it. I couldn't appreciate it enough. Good. And does she sure. now? What does she feel about what you're finding? I mean, does she get excited about it the same way you do? Oh, yeah, she gets excited about it, but at the same time, she probably gets tired of hearing about it. Because, <laughs> <God's story. laughs> yeah, you, you, you know how it is when we get excited as we're researching, you just got to tell somebody, and she's the only person there, so she hears it <laughs> constantly. <laughs> but, no, she, well, she, she would make a nice and, feminine input into some of the things, too, so you should hire her on as part of your <laughs> your uh, partnership there with finding that uh, that balance between the male and the female energies, which would be great. Well, you well, know, and you have kids too, yes? Did you do you have kids uh, or no? No, we don't. No. Oh, well, we maybe I'm tapping kids. into something psychically and you're you're going to uh, down uh, the road. I'm just going to say that's too weird. Because <laughs> we are trying. <laughs> oh, okay, well, you know that that that's what I do. So anyway, uh, moving yeah, on. I know. I know that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have a couple minutes uh, left in the show and I'd like to give you an opportunity to use the last few minutes that we have to really push your own message out there and and what you feel is uh, is humanity's destiny at this point? Where are we headed? It's a big thing to ask of you, but I think you're I think you're going to be able to channel it right through. Well, obviously, things are, for lack of a better word, really strange, really weird right now in the world. Uh, but personally, I think it's you know we go through the cycles, through the ups, through the downs, and it's I know that. A lot of people right now are saying how tough it is on them, what hard times they're going through, and well, I couldn't agree more. Really, I'm going through those same hard times right now, but I, I, you know, this is all it's all a learning experience, and I think everything we're going through is all about learning for what's tomorrow. And I think that's a big point of it, and you know, I, that's one of the reasons I like to talk about these parks and these sacred landscapes is because. In this field, a lot of you can talk about a lot of different stuff, but there's not too many things where you can talk about and have people go out there and experience, actually experience it firsthand themselves and make a change in themselves. And that's why I really, really want to push people to go out to these new modern urban parks or the sacred mound sites because these places can have a change on you. And when it has a change on you, it has a change on everybody else around you, and it, that that's what's really important, I think. So, if, 
you know, you get an opportunity next time you're in one of these cities and you're stuck in your hotel room, go down to the nearest park and see what you can personally dig up. You might be Take some pictures and take a take a pen and a notebook and (laughs) and channel it through. Thanks, Chad, for being here. You've been wonderful and best of luck with everything. Take a girl with you too. (laughs) Right. See? (laughs) Cosmic dating. It's the new thing, I swear. All right, Chad, thanks so much for being here. Uh, everybody, you are uh, we're out of time. That's that's the way it goes. Till next time, namaste everyone, good night.